Um, this is the first for the semester's Potent Residence Reading Series here at the University of Dubuque. It's, I'm the Potent Residence, Lauren Elaine, and um, it's my pleasure and job to bring to you guys uh, every semester a few authors, um, some poets, memoirists, fiction writers. I'm trying to get a playwright someday. Um, to sort of just enrich our campus, liven the conversation between people who write literature and those of us who read and study it, and anybody else who's interesting, interested rather in um, exploring language and all the wonderful things it can do with us. Um, this evening, our potent residence reader is Christopher Bakken. I can tell you a lot of things about Dr. Christopher Bakken, things you think you want to know, like he's a professor of English at Allegheny College in Pennsylvania, that he's an award-winning poet, essayist, and translator who's published in esteemed venues such as the Paris Review, Plowshares, the Southwest Review, among others, that he served as a Fulbright Scholar in American Studies at the University of Bucharest in 2008, and that he's from Madison, Wisconsin, which means he actually had heard of Dubuque before coming to read here, <laughs> which is pretty cool. Um, but there are a few things you need to know about Christopher Bakken. He loves reggae, and he will blast it from his tablet while sitting on the shores of a beach with a ragtag group of writers at midnight. He'll probably have a bottle of Cipro to pass around. <laughs> Uh, and if you don't know what that is, you want to look it up. Um, he might start to sing in Greek when the Bob Marley times out, um, or he might just lie on the sand and stare at the sky. Um, he will pull you out of your chair, and shoulder to shoulder, you will move your feet in Greek. He will cook things that will make your taste buds do cartwheels and beg for more. Um, one of them may be a whole roasted lamb, entire head feet and everything. He will charm all the local food sellers into giving up their most cherished recipes, the fruit or cheese they were saving for a special client or a special occasion. They'll box it up and give it to Christopher and throw in a bottle of hand-pressed olive oil and some limonocello <laughs> for good measure and say, come again, you know. Um, this is Christopher Bakken. His wit, intelligence, and charm begin in his person, but manifest in his work as wonder for all things of the earth, particularly when they exist on the Greek portion of the globe. In his award-winning collections of poetry after Greece and goat funeral, and in his culinary memoir, Honey of Octopus, Christopher will take you on a cultural expedition that is driven by curiosity and connection one with a guide who is both savvy but still an apprentice and who is suspended between inclusion and confusion, honorary citizenship and tourism. On this journey, you will learn about the most ancient types of sustainable stewardship of land and resources, how we make and maintain relationships around food, how what we put into our bodies can tell us about who we are, and all sorts of really wonderful things that I'm gonna let you uh, tell you about himself. So please join me in welcoming Christopher Bakken. Good evening. I can't tell any of the stories about Lauren, can I? Because she teaches here. Bless you. I will say this much, that uh, one of the things I wasn't expecting, come in. Yeah. Cheers. Sure, cheers. I'm going to read for three hours. You're going to be so tired if you stand out back there. No, maybe maybe 35 minutes. Um, one of the things I did not expect when I was going to the island of Serifos for a month was that at night, if I stepped on my balcony for, yes, one last glass of island moonshine, that if I, if I listened really carefully, my downstairs neighbors, not one, but two women from Trinidad, would probably be up and would be laughing, and I would hear that just, it's the Trini laugh. It's the best island uh, soundtrack in the world. Uh, yes, you and Samantha, and, and all the rest of your bad company, yeah. Uh, thrilled to be here in Dubuque. I've been um, up in Cheeseland for a couple of days with my parents, uh, so if my Wisconsin accent, I doubt it will, but if it comes back, you'll forgive me for that. And I thought I might begin, I'm gonna make kind of a prose sandwich. Come on, there you go. I'm just going to direct traffic for a little while. There are chairs. Uh, I thought I'd read some poems at the beginning, and then a chunk of the memoir, and then I'll, I'll end with some really spooky, scary poems to put you in the mood for, I don't know, Halloween. <laughs> Sound good? By way of invocation, 
I thought I would read uh, a poem from each of my first two books. Uh, I visited, it was Nathan's class today, and we were talking, uh, they're reading ancient literature, Greek and Roman and Egyptian, and talking about the way that when you're in a place like Greece, and I, I don't only write about Greece, but it's my favorite subject, you literally feel the stratification of history beneath your feet at any given moment. Uh, and this poem uh, is for those of you in that class, because I think it's an attempt to evoke that. There's a place called Dion at the base of Mount Olympus. It's a, a new archaeological site, a bit of an oxymoron, that phrase, um, which is said they've only been digging there for about 40 years. And it was the holiest place in northern Greece uh, as a kind of snub to the snobbish Athenians. When Alexander the Great goes off to conquer the world, he goes to burn his hecatombs at Dion instead of Delphi. Um, Poem's called Dion, and it opens with an epigraph by Yanis Ritsos. In this way, every morning, all the houses smoke. They rescued five goddesses this year, hauled from roots and mountain mud. But today the men will wait before work, fat with hunger, while women fry onions and keftedakia in the cramped kitchen. By noon, I'll join them, sweltering in pits, peering my foreign eyes into their past as we move earth and open it wider. At Cafe Zeus Olympios, on this table, beneath a sagging trellis of grapes, there's always one ashtray and some salt, and somewhere another mound to excavate. Brush, pick, sift screen, barrow, silt and strata of an imagined nation buried at the outskirts of what we see, where our digging borders the grain fields. Here, I believe in stone, existence in the flesh, this cool libation in a galvanized pail, water enough to rinse the urns and shard pile in the long pause before our feast begins, the city beneath us constantly returns and new tendrils unfurl from crowded vines. Silence blazes around the page where I write, since the earth is God, I am not dust, but God. It's a really arrogant way to start a reading, isn't it? Uh, it's actually, that last line is actually stolen from a Greek tomb. It's one of those things you find it, you say, I have to use that in a poem. And I'll read one poem from my second book. Um, one of the things I love about reading in this area is how it brings me back to my agrarian roots. And uh, the question people always ask is, I'm not Greek, not even one bit. I'm half Norwegian and half Swiss. You know where the dumb part comes from, my Norwegian family would say, and they meant the Norwegian side. Um, but I grew up on dairy farms in Wisconsin and grew up with an appreciation of what it takes to bring a meal from the table, or from the field to the table. Uh, and it just occurred to me when I was reading in Madison, that completely explains why a Swiss-Norwegian hockey-playing hick would go to Greece and write a book about food. <laughs> That's pretty much what I am. Um, this is called Eclogue 4, Goat Funeral. Oh, I have to say one thing. I define one thing for you, otherwise you won't get the reference. There's something called buzuki. This is a quiz. Musicians out there, what is a buzuki? Wow, I was, there's usually one music nerd in the room who says, of course, yeah? Yeah, exactly, like a pot-bellied mandolin, precisely. It's both an instrument, buzuki, and it's also a thing you do, and it's a kind of style of music. Uh, if you're young and 20-something and you have a little money to burn in Greece, you go out and do buzuki, which involves drinking, standing atop tables and dancing, and throwing flowers at singers. It's all very obscene and way too much fun. Let me start again. Eclogue 4, Goat Funeral. I fled the tavern, soaked with booze and gravitas, stumbled into the scrub along the river, cursing the whole crowd, their buzuki kitsch, the ardor of their mob confidence, woke only when that shepherd Juliana lit the pyre for her stillborn goat, wailed against the spirit that claimed it too soon. Understand that it was early, the grass still slick, her firewood soggy with smoke. The sycamores were involved with their fog. The deer were busy hiding in the brush. 
She had acacia blossoms in her braids, and I saw the little pollen dusted the shoulder where she'd rent her mourning shawl. The dead one was wreathed with olive leaves, a pile of grain uneaten at the mouth. We made an odd society by that bank, two humans, too familiar with the dead, the dead still waiting for someone to speak, the wilderness around us watching, the town behind us stupidly asleep. What choice did I have? The goat was dead, the girl pretty, the river risen too high. It was for her, the animal inside me rose from its lair, shook off its winter sleep, and I took her in my arms and stoked the fire and helped her burn, O oh, heartless God, the little beast. I had to read that because I'm right next to the Mississippi River, so the river isn't too high, seems like it's the right thing to do. And no goats were actually hurt in the making of that poem. <laughs> Uh, once upon a time, there was a boy named Aaron Bakken, that's my brother, who, um, well, let me start somewhere else, and then I'll tell you about Aaron Bakken. I have a friend named Tassos of Thassos, who is a kind of superhero. Um, yes, he lives in the island of Thassos, and his name is Tassos. His cousin is also named Tassos of Thassos, and they're named after their uncle, also named Tassos of Thassos. And after um, a long night of celebration on his island, on his patio, um, I'd had a little too much Cipero. This is this, this drink you refer to. It's Uzo's evil cousin. Think homemade Uzo. I said, so when do, you, when do you pick your olives? And he said, sometime in November. And I said, well, I should join you one of these years. And he said, good, we will wait for you. We expect you. And I woke up the next morning realizing that I'd promised to come and harvest his olives in November, hired hand. Um, which brings me to Aaron Bakken, my brother, who in the space of one month had a heart attack at the age of 37, a neck tumor, and a divorce. You can guess which one caused the other two. That was the divorce. He lives, all, all's well with my brother, but since we're from, you grew up on dairy farms, the solution, when anything ails you, is you go and you get your hands dirty and you work. So I said, hey, I did promise this dude on Thassos that I'd come pick his olives, so let's go. And so we did. Um, in order to fund this trip, I decided, decided to pitch uh, to Bon Appetit magazine that I, completely unknown person who wrote poetry, would write for them about the Greek olive harvest. Their response was just what I expected. Who the hell are you? But they said they were interested, so I went, and instead of writing 500 words about olives, I wrote 13,000 words about a bunch of other stuff. Um, and had so much fun doing it that I wrote this book. I'll, uh, I'll read a little section. This is how the book opens, and then maybe I'll explain to you sort of the theory of how this memoir works a little bit. Tassos of Thassos, whose olives we shall pick, has been drinking Cipero at a wedding all night, until just hours ago, in other words, so when he greets us at the port, we can see he's a cheerful disaster. The list of things Tassos Kuzis can do is daunting. With equal proficiency, he manages to be a restaurateur, farmer, shepherd, octopus fisherman, rabbit hunter, traditional dancer, and wedding singer. The fact that he served in the Greek Special Forces means he has other skills he cannot disclose. He's also indisputably handsome, black hair, close crop beard, irrepressible smile, which helps him play his various roles with perfect sprezzatura. It hurts me to drive slowly, he tells us, so put on your seatbelts. In spite of his hangover, he attacks each switchback. We zoom past the massive marble quarries, so huge that cranes and bulldozers at the bottom look like toys. Through the village of Panagia, where the competing identical cafes in the main square are opening simultaneously. Past three deserted beach towns, around two herds of errant sheep, and one lost cow. Abruptly, as we round the southern shoulder of the island, the dense shag of pine and oak gives way to a barren forest of boulders that drops jaggedly down to the sea. Tassos pulls up next to the guardrail on the wrong side of the road so we can orient ourselves. The wind is blowing from the southeast, making visible what is usually obscured, Samothraki, the most haunted and pagan of all the Greek islands, 
which agitates the horizon like a purple gash. Beyond that, we can see the faintly pulsating outline of Asia Minor and the low molars of the island of Limnos. And after two more bends in the road, we spy Mount Athos, sacred home of a thousand monks and hermits and not a single woman. Legend has it, no woman has set foot on the peninsula since the Virgin Mary herself. In order to fetch us at the port, Tassos left his parents behind in the olive grove. So we drop our bags at Pension Arcondisa, where we'll be staying, and join them right away. Don't worry, we came here to work, I remind Tassos. His parents, undistracted by the noisy fowl that surround them, peacocks, geese, ducks, and dozens of chickens, are just pouring the first coffee of the day and are unloading a crate full of breakfast. Bread, boiled eggs, tiropites, those are cheese pies, and oranges they plucked from their own tree. Tassos' father, Stamatis, rises to greet me with a leathery handshake and two kisses. Though now sporting a harvest costume with flannel and denim, he's a fisherman and he looks like one. Aquiline nose, sunburned skin, and a shock of unruly hair. Tassos' mother, Evanthea, has something of the Venus of Willendorf about her. She's utterly sturdy, working here all month beside the men, and yet she radiates maternal softness and grace, her voice a joyful lilt, her face always on the precipice of a smile. Both parents seem a little stunned that I've actually come. Surely my vow to join their olive harvest, sworn after a long night of drinking the previous summer, was not in earnest. Yet here I am, with my brother in tow, stocking-capped, combat-booted, and armed, armored in canvas and fleece. As for Tassos, he's picking olives in his Armani jeans. So that's the way it opens. Uh, I followed this guy Tassos of Thassos uh, throughout several of the chapters. Another guy named George Kaltzas, a mild-mannered hotel manager from the city of Kavala. Okay, a quiz for those in Nathan's class. Modern Kabbalah is ancient book of the New Testament. Getting warmer. Ancient Philippi. Nathan will be very upset with you. Um, George found out he had cancer when he was about 33, and just because he's cranky like that, said, I'm not doing chemotherapy. Uh, I have my own method to deal with this disease. And he stripped down most of his clothes and swam from the mainland to the island of Thassos, uh, where he arrived dripping wet with a few drachmas in his pocket and decided I'm going, he's going to live a life of labor, vegetarianism, and philosophy, reading the novels of Kazantzakis and thinking way too much about Friedrich Nietzsche. And indeed, his cancer went into remission. I don't recommend this method of healing in any way, um, but George has lived literally to sit around and drink wine uh, and have friends, friendships that are deep and abiding. Um, and the bookworm and the adventure hero, these are the two guys I sort of follow throughout this book. Um, and a Hollywood romance is, ends up happening. Tassos, well, let me say this much. There's a woman from Istanbul who sells diamonds for a living in LA, and she becomes an important character in this book. Um, there are eight chapters. I take the eight elements of the Greek table bread, olives, cheese, wine, fish, and I had this genius idea that I wanted to find the single best example of each one, which meant that I had to go around Greece trying to figure out what that meant. Um, I have a love handle called, you know, Noxy and Cheese as a result. Um, what I figured out in the writing of this book is that I may have been the last, one of the last people to be able to actually do this. Um, as you can probably expect, the people who still know how to make these traditional products are artisans, and they're old, and they're dying out. Um, the, the, this is, these are the grandparents uh, of the young people who are now hooked on YouTube and this thing called the internet. You've probably heard of it. Um, and that's radically changed Greek culture. Kentucky Fried Chicken and McDonald's are now in Athens. Obesity rates are rising among Greeks. And so there's a happy side. There's a lot of drinking and dancing and celebration in this book, but also this other mournful side that many of these things are dying out. Um, that's the theory. I wanted to read one, uh, one more passage from the memoir set on the island of Seriphos, because that's where, actually, I got to hang out with Lauren. Um, and it speaks right to the thing that I was just describing. Even in midsummer, the winds of Seriphos can begin howling, and the temperature will suddenly drop. This is a pan-cycladic phenomenon 
But the wind seems especially intense on Seriphos. When it starts up this year, everyone gets depressed, complaining of headaches and sore throats. Nothing tastes as it should. All writing comes to a standstill, and we're visited by bizarre dreams. Villagers claim that vampires are flushed from their hiding places in such weather. Everyone on this island, my friend Aliki Barnstone writes of Seriphos, knows the wind carries the voices of ghosts. When things get this bad, Rakhomolo is the only thing that helps. Even if that means ascending the mountain and diving right into the heart of the wind, which pits all its force against the ancient whitewashed buildings of the old town, the Hora. It's worth climbing 100 stairs to get to Stratos Cafe, where they have the best Rakomolo on the island. The drink, which consists of strong island raki, molded with honey and spices, is served warm in little glasses, and you sip it while clutching your cup, huddled with your friends against the wind. Rakomolo warms your insides and takes the edge off your madness. And, after a few glasses, I find I have to pee. The men's room at Stratos, however, is completely dark, and through a hidden air vent, the wind is shrieking and clanging. I feel around the door jamb and run my hands along the walls, hoping to find the light switch. At last, when I step forward into the darkness, the light flickers on. Seen in the bathroom mirror, I look vaguely Medusa-like, my wind-whipped hair sticking out every which way. Beneath the mirror, a handwritten sign explains in Greek that the light is activated by a motion detector. Duh. There's also this English translation. Movement is required for illumination. Just think about that for a second. Given the extra meanings of the word movement in a laboratory setting, <laughs> movement is required for illumination. There are lots of ways to enlightenment, as it turns out. And on Seriphos, they figured this other one out. Movement is required for illumination. I find this hilarious. But I take heart in the sign's unintentional profundity, too. Most days on the island, it's easy to forget we're moving at all. Once the wind dies down, we settle into a blissful and slothful routine. There are morning visits to the market and bakery, some seminar activity, and writing time, and then long afternoons since swimming and eating. Among all that pleasure and slow movement, there's only one frustration. And I'm going to stop there and say, this is a frustration really that a boy from Wisconsin feels very deeply. You'll understand when I tell you what it is. On my return trip from the market every day, I drive past a sign advertising Local traditional cheese. But I can't seem to make contact with the cheesemaker, Rita Paraskevopoulos, whose name is on the sign. I've dialed her number every day for a week, but the phone just rings and rings. Finally, near the end of my stay, I try the number again, and this time, Rita picks up right away. Rita is the most cheerful person I've ever met. When she laughs, she throws her body into it, scrunching her shoulders forward, clenching her fists, and nodding her unnaturally reddish curls up and down, all the while emitting a high-pitched weenie. She has a prodigious nose and thick arms strengthened by years of farm work, and I have to suppress an urge to hug her, but we've only just met. She leads me into a foyer lined with shelves of homemade delicacies, caper berries, dried tomatoes, limoncello, raki, and spoon sweets made from figs, quince, tangerines, and green walnuts. There's also a refrigerator full of cheese. Rita has 80 goats and 100 sheep, which she milks in a pen adjacent to her kitchen. Since I haven't seen Rita's products in the local markets, I wonder how she moves the stuff. Mostly, she explains, she sells her cheese to her neighbors, though she also supplies a few restaurants with, with fresh mizithra, but only those she trusts. Everyone will say they buy their fresh mizithra from me, but it's not true. Most of it is frozen, and some of it even arrives by boat. I only sell the restaurants who promise to serve it the same day when it's still sweet. After that, it's too late. She pauses for a moment before bursting into laughter again at the absurdity of cheese fraud, I guess. Well, we nibble her cheeses. She tells stories about her four-year-old grandson 
who recently told her that he wants to be a shepherd or a politician when he grows up. Either way, Rita says, her giggle rising in anticipation of the punchline, I told him he'll spend his life yelling. But at least if he's a shepherd, he'll be able to keep his flock in order. At that, she cackles and bobs up and down as she's completely out of breath, and the joke is much funnier given the current chaos of Greek politics. The same grandson, she continues, was recently told that he'd be inheriting the farm one day. He looked up at his grandfather to see if he was joking, then stretched out his arms imperiously and declared, It's all mine? That sets off another fit of laughter in us both. Rita has to wipe tears away with the back of her hand in order to write up the bill for all the stuff I'm buying. Just then, her husband, Yorgos, walks in. My nose tells me he's been working. He's a jowly fellow with bags under his eyes. When we shake hands, mine feels tiny compared to his calloused bear paw. Then I ask him about the red barrels in the corner, which I expect are full of oil or wine. At that, he smiles nervously. Rita interjects quickly that they're for the French. When I press her, she explains that several years ago, some formagier made a pilgrimage from Paris here to make reservations for an almost forgotten Cycladic cheese. The project is now in its final stages. It's a very special product whose history goes back many centuries on the island, Yorgos tells me. Before we had refrigeration, our ancestors found ways to make cheese survive. Inside these barrels is La Cotiro. I may be the only one still making it on the island. Now, Lacos, as in La Cotiro, can mean cesspool in certain contexts. So any translation of La Cotiro, cesspool cheese, is going to come out sounding pretty revolting. But whole cheese or pit cheese or trench cheese are all pretty much near the mark. In the old days, wheels of cheese would be placed between layers of siguri, an herb resembling wild thyme, in an earthen pit, which was then sealed for not one, but two years. Today, Yorgos uses plastic barrels instead of earthen pits. These he keeps at room temperature and never opens. But he agrees to unscrew one of the heavy lids for me. After two years without refrigeration, the cheese will, I expect, stink to high heaven. Instead, it's as if Yorgos has opened a barrel of Seraphosian hillside air, dry soil, salt breeze, and warm vegetation. He reaches his arm down into the shadows to lift out what looks like a moth-eaten wig of gray dreadlocks. The herbs have almost entirely disintegrated and are now inextricable from the wheel of cheese they enclose. Their function, Yorgos explains, is to draw the moisture from the cheese. What results is something extremely desirable to the French, and to me, a hideous, crumbly, extremely stinky cheese. It's much better than Roquefort, Yorgos Crows. And, to my disappointment, he says I will not be able to taste any. The French reserve these cheeses, and they'll return at summer's end to fetch them, already waiting a long time. Of course, I'm not to be deterred. And not only because I really want to try this cheese, I also love the idea of stealing from the French, who will no doubt sell puny morsels of this cheese at an enormous profit to fussy Parisian ladies with yappy little dogs. Sorry. <laughs> French people, am I insulting? In Dubuque. Are there still French people in Dubuque? Invoking my research into local foodways, including the chickpeas of Platillalos and the cucumbers of Vicos of Sicamia, you don't know who those people are, not to mention my own dairy farming American grandfathers, I eventually went out. Rita shrugs her shoulders and says, why not? Yorgos agrees to sell me a wheel as long as I promise never to put it anywhere near the refrigerator. It fears the cold, he tells me. The wheel is worth every euro I spend on it, and it's the best souvenir I could hope to buy. The cheese has an unearthly funk that bewilders everyone who tastes it over the next few days, including Lauren, I think. I'm in a hurry to force it on people and use it up before flying home. In the end, I mummify the last wedge of it in paper towels 
and smuggle it through customs at JFK. Wanting, as always, to bring the flavor of the islands back home with me. Some poems? You cool with that? Do we need calisthenics before we go there? Um, it's always, you know, what the reader really wants to do is read the stuff that he's, he or she is working on at the moment. Um, and I've been writing these things that I call dream songs. Though I don't, you, normally if I say dream songs, you'd immediately think of the American poet John Berryman. I don't think my dream songs are anything um, like that. But they are dream songs in this way. Um, the imagery and the sort of plots of these, and they're all fairly short, I think come out of uh, dreams or those states where we're not quite awake and we're not quite asleep. Um, what they all seem to have in common is there's two people who are falling apart in various ways. And by falling apart, I, I mean that in several different senses. Um, and reality is a little bit estranged from reality. I don't know much, uh, I don't really know how to explain them to myself much beyond that. They're um, coming out in a hurry in these little quick bursts. And so when the muse shows up and says, here, take a bunch of short poems, you don't say, no, I'd really like some long ones instead that I understand. Um, you, just, you just go. Um, here they are. I'll read five of them or so. Anyone know the poet Philip Larkin? Great British poet. He's written a beautiful poem called Obad, uh, which is probably the greatest, you look, you Wikipedia this when you get home. I think maybe the greatest and most fearless poem ever written um, about death. Uh, Obad is actually not a death thing. It's a song to be sung at the break of day. We'd not slept in days, or else we were still sleeping. Who could tell? Few words passed between us then, yet somehow we heard what the other said. In that room, we had a copper pot, a guitar, and a tower of old newspapers. Fruit you'd cut, now brown on a plate. From some black clay, you were shaping a small, tall building with no windows. It leaned uncomfortably to the left, as if pressed by hard wind. You didn't bother to write it. It had been a long time, one of us might have said, since the last trucks returned from the border. I showed you an ancient silver coin. On one side, a gorgon's head, off center and missing an ear. What's this on the other side? I asked. I didn't have to ask this aloud. A stag, maybe, or a bull. We didn't know. The body was worn away, but the horns were still sharp. Just before dawn, some noise of cats and garbage in the street. You said, come with me. And at last, we put down our glasses, walked in silence to the water, where one boat was unloading its nets. First light, fish shining on the dock like a pile of just polished knives. I told you they're weird. This one's called Myth. On the stove, greens she stole from the mountain. She gave an hour to pulling them apart. Steam rose from the pot, pleasing the invisible. He sat with his book by the back window, reading the horizon for lightning. Stormy watches, bringing the dark ship light, some ancient sentence broken on the page. Outside, rain punished the earth for its crimes. No, she said, the earth bore none of the guilt. Proving it didn't care, a crow complained to the cypress tree on behalf of all birds. Three lemons on guard beside their blue bowl. Below the house, the sea surged into a cave. No, she said, the cave opened to the sea. I mentioned that place Mount Athos in the passage I read from the memoir which is a real place. It's a peninsula, and no woman has stepped foot on there since the Virgin Mary, in theory. In fact, several Greek uh, female journalists dressed in drag and tried to get on the island 
and even they did not succeed. Um, it's still in the Byzantine clock. Uh, it is a holy place, or considered to be holy by many, many people. And um, part of this dream seems to be happening there. It's called confession. Night came to hurt us from across the island, resurrecting crickets in the old well. You'd removed both of your arms, and your hair had turned to ash by the time I touched it. If you go, I asked, how will we speak to those dead? I said this knowing we couldn't ever. Yet monks had put out a wooden table and were waiting for the blood and bread. All day the mountain talking and falling apart. I had to carry you most of the way. All day eternity and oranges, stones in some fear I could and couldn't see. Now a half moon and the stars were roaring. The orchard behind us was roaring too. I couldn't bear their chanting anymore and urged myself to disappear like you. Two more. Uh, oh, students of ancient history. Who knows what a thyrsus is? Nathan's going to give serious bonus points if anyone answers this question correctly. Followers of Dionysus? We're not getting any warmer, are we? Uh, the Maenads, those are the women who followed Dionysus, uh, would drink lots and lots of wine and go into the hills for a period of days and go raving mad and eat anyone who came near them. Rip them to flesh. This is what happens when you drink too much wine. Let that be a lesson to you before spring break arrives. Um, a thyrsus is actually a long pole, usually made of a pine branch, at the end of which are hung uh, pine cones. And for some reason, this is the sacred sort of instrument or wand that they used to call the god Dionysus. Um, poem's called Thyrsus. That book was old as the corpse itself, and its tongue weight was too long a burden. I said I'd read the ending if you asked, the part about the satyr and the cliff. We'd found a shady clearing on the beach and had come to destroy ourselves with joy. Smoke from some sacrifice stung our eyes and pine cones were gathered at our feet like loose grenades. In this kind of dream, we knew they'd explode if they touched water. Even the logic of the elements had been sabotaged by our being here. I offered to recite the middle instead, showed you how the dry pages trembled when I ransomed their sentences to air. The book will know how to save us, I said, and this wine in our glass is a mirror we'll see through by reading in reverse. No. Started it at the beginning, you said at last, then walked into the sea, a pine cone balanced in your open palm. Last one. This is called Interior with a Bowl of Matches. Why not? I have one called Exterior with Knife and Net, Interior with Closed Notebook. I don't know. Interior with a bowl of matches. Because something's missing from the room, he goes out. It's beside the millstone in the garden. Because the cliff rises behind the house, she comes naked from the bath, puts a red blanket on the bed, and doesn't sleep. A moth tastes light caught in the mirror. A broken cork, wine. The window, rain. Because it is September, he returns hungry. The ceiling's wooden beams don't hold. Nails pry loose from the floorboards. A shallow bowl of wooden matches trembles on the cabinet by the door. And a vase with one drenched poppy. Outside, the sea, indifferent as glass. Thanks.
I think I think what Lauren just said is do interpretive dance and answer questions. Is that what that meant? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> of course, I'm happy to answer questions if you have them. What was the title of your first piece? I didn't quite catch it. Uh, the very first poem I read? Yes. Dion. Thank you. I had to think. My playlist is on the floor. D-I-O-N. I think there was a bad 70s pop singer named Dion, wasn't there? Uh, not to be confused with the archaeological site at the base of Mount Olympus. Do you mean the poems or the memoir or all of the above? All of the above. Yeah. Did you guys hear the question? Did I know what I was going to write before I wrote it? Uh, that's a great question. It brings me right maybe to the difference between poetry and prose. Um, as it turns out, this is my really my first excursion in prose. And with prose, as your teachers in composition class have been telling you over and over again, you probably should have an idea where you're going, which is to say you, you need a destination. Um, because, you, you know, you follow the train of ideas and there needs to be some coherence. Um, that's only partly true, I think, with the prose I was writing. And I'll get to the poetry in a second, because that answer is easier. Um, I set out to write about something like stinky cheese on Naxos. But on the island, so I go, why does one island in Greece have all the good cheese? They have a monopoly on it. It's not fair to the rest of the Greek islands. Um, they have literally ten kinds of strange cheeses, and the answer and I had to go there to find out, is cows and sheep and goats. And there's just more of them and better grazing land and an interesting artisanal tradition. But while I'm on Noxus, I also find out that there's a weird history of emery mining on the island. And I'm just fascinated by that. You know what emery is? What's an emery board? A thing you file your nails with. It actually used to be a mineral substance that they would glue onto boards. Uh, and for years, so in fact, the very first emery mines were on the island of Noxus. They built this sort of cable cars from atop the mountain until some stupid American invented artificial emery and, you know, killed the business. We should go to this. Um, so anyway, I start writing about emery mines. Uh, I have this weird encounter with a guy down by a fish market, which is to say, you set it with an idea, and then I think you're, you're dumb if you don't let other ideas interfere with you as you go. Um, this is not a good strategy, again, for composition class assignments, you know, where I was set out to write about X, and I found myself writing about Superman. Um, that's not a good way to get good grades. Um, as for poetry, I think when I started writing poetry, I really thought that I needed a controlling idea or a triggering subject, and I should probably stay close to it. Um, I think one of the pleasures of these dream songs is that I honestly have no earthly idea where they're headed uh, when I start writing one. I did not know, for instance, in that poem, Thyrsus, I had this image of the poem starts with pine cones underneath a tree, and it occurred to me they, they look like, uh, you know, they've been thrown there like loose grenades. I have no idea what brought this on. But I didn't realize that at the end of that poem, someone was going to wade into the water with a pine cone, which was about to explode. That was a complete surprise. That ending just happened. So it's writing with an idea of where you're headed, but allowing also then accidents to happen. How'd that, did that answer your question? Yeah. Good. Someone else over here had a hand up a second ago. Oh, way in the back. I like he emerges from behind the stained glass. <laughs> I can't see how old you are, but, but from way back there. But 87. But if you, since you brought it up, since you brought to Mark it up, it just reminds me. You, like when I hear you talk about like the sticky cheese and stuff, it reminds me of, of Larkin's book, Jill, uh -huh. and, and his observations as he's marching around Oxford and, yeah. and all that. Was Larkin very... His poetry, for sure. Not, not so much the prose. I mean, Jill's an interesting book. I actually think it's kind of an underrated novel by a great poet. But his poem is a really, really important to me. Um, I started out as a formalist. I mean, I think I still probably am. Not a new formalist, because, you know, it never really got old. Um, but my teacher was a guy named Derek Walcott, who, you know, said, Here, if you want to learn to be a poet, you better, you better damn well embrace the DNA of poetry, and that's meter which is something I'd never been taught. You know, I did an MFA, I did all these pro this stuff in, uh, in college, all these writing workshops, and no one really ever talked to me about meter, which is odd, because since it's one of the fundamental building blocks of poetry. So Walkout would actually make us walk around Harlem in iambic pentameter, um, and while reciting Hart Crane. It was really embarrassing, but you know, 
it's Derek Walcott. If he tells you to do it, you're going to do it. And so we did. But as I began embracing, I think, the, the virtues of, of meter as, a, as an instrument of composition, by which I mean when I sit down to write poems, typically the way I'm making lines happen is um, with meter. And then I usually will take and mess it up later so it's not quite so um, controlling. But of the poets then that Walcott made us read, Larkin was one of them that just hit me, um, sort of right in the forehead and said, where have you been all my life? Well, you're, and yeah. you're interested in, in Greek poetry Right. The, the, I, I can't read original Greek, but the translation by, what was his name, Kimon Fryer. Uh huh. Fact, sure. Is his poetry book. And um, Cousin Zakis. Mm -hmm. I think it's Odyssey, was it? Yep, he, re he writes the Odyssey in Cretan dialect. Something that's completely untranslatable into English, but sorry, cut you off. Well, um, Fryer, Fryer would disagree with that. He would. Probably and he did a good job with it, yeah. Uh, well, I also translate Greek poetry uh, with, a, with a native speaker, and that's been a real thrilling project to work on as well. Um, yeah, it's right, there are no coincidences, I found out. Um, yeah, my life's a good example of that. That's right. Yeah. How did you become enamored of Greece? That's a good question. I found a book in a garbage can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, you want me to keep going? Yeah. It's not entirely. It's that's a little bit of a lie because uh, I was already a little bit in love with the place. I went to UW Madison. Well, here's a cautionary tale. Don't live with eight skateboarders your first semester of college in the basement of the Casablanca apartment buildings. That's not a recipe for a good GPA. Um, and I almost didn't go even go to college. I was going to move to Sweden. I don't know, just seemed like a good idea for a young Norwegian boy to do. Um, but I did go, and I didn't do very well my first year, and then I, I sat in a class taught by an art historian named Warren Moon, not the football player. You guys never even heard of Warren Moon, probably most of you. Um, but he was a historian of ancient Greek sculpture. That's his specialty. Um, he was an old hippie from the University of Chicago who studied with the great uh, comparative religionist Mircea Eliade, and was just a, a kook of a guy. And he'd come to the restaurant where I used to work and eat T-bones and drink gin martinis, and then he'd throw parties for graduate students. And I got myself invited to these parties and just, wow, these people talk about interesting stuff. My friends are boring. Um, and Warren at one point turned to me and said, so why is it you're not getting good grades? Is it because, let's see, you never do the reading and you never go to class. Could that be the reason? I said, yeah, well, you're getting pretty warm there, yeah. Um, and he said, well, look, I want you to sit in every class I teach, and I want you to go to all your other classes and, you know, do the readings. It is, it's magical how that works. Uh, it really, sorry, that was complete professor propaganda. They paid me to say this. <laughs> it's not really true. You don't need to study at all. Um, but anyway, my, so my interest in Greece started there. I was fascinated by uh, ancient Greece in particular. But I was working in New York City at Union Square, and my boss threw out a book called Teaching Overseas. We were a poetry magazine. Why did they send it to us? He was outraged. He threw it in the garbage, and I said, I'll read that on my way back to Harlem. After all, I have $40,000 worth of loans to pay off with a degree in, wait for it, poetry. <laughs> I'm effectively useless to society. Um, well, useful in other spiritual ways, very important calling. But I applied to teaching jobs anywhere near good water in the equator, um, all across Asia and Europe, but especially in Greece. I peppered the place with applications and heard nothing from any of these schools. Um, one place had said, you know, send us a photo and a, and a more extensive CV. Uh, I finally got a job offer to teach at a place called Anatolia College in Thessaloniki. Um, and they called and said, well, we're interested in you. And I said, well, when does this job start? Like, like December or next fall? They said, we'd like you here Saturday. So I went to Greece on Saturday. Now, I'd never been in Europe before. I'm a Swiss-Norwegian kid from Wisconsin. They said, you're going to be soccer coach. We saw that you play soccer. Uh, and you'll be teaching four classes for us. And that's how I fell in love with the place. They gave me an envelope full of uh, drachmas. It was the old Greek money. It was like Monopoly money with Greek gods on it. <laughs> and there was a lot of it. Like 5,000 drachmas, you know, to buy a coffee. Uh, and I loved it. Uh, and, and then meanwhile, they were paying my student loans back at home. And I had a motorcycle. 
and I would finish teaching at 3 p.m. on Fridays, and you'd buzz your motorcycle down to the port, and you'd say, where's it going? And these beautiful places like Crete and Santorini and Lesbos and Samos, and so you'd go for the weekend. And so that's really how I fell in love with the place. Um, yeah. I could keep going, but that's my... That's my sh the short version of my answer. Yeah. Follow-up question. See, she wants me to keep going. <laughs> did, you, you had a Fulbright? I did. You studied, where was that, too? Uh, uh, that's, you, you just like, touched a bruise. I applied for a Fulbright in Greece, of course. This is, I, I did in 2008, years after actually living in Greece. Mm -hmm. um, and they called me and said, sorry, we, we're going to give you a Fulbright. But the one in Greece is going to this old guy who we've been waiting to, for him to apply for the Fulbright. You know, he's super distinguished, and we're going to give the Fulbright to him. Have you ever considered Bucharest, they said to me. And my answer was, no. <laughs> I have not considered Bucharest, not in really any way at all. Um, but I went home and said to my wife, have you ever considered Bucharest? We're not going to Greece. And to my great surprise, she said, well, why not? Sounds like an adventure. Yeah. And so I, um, here's another cautionary tale. My life is filled with these. How about when you move to Bucharest with your family, don't move with a toddler and a five-year-old in post-communist slum housing above sex shop on Piazza La Hovari. It was a fascinating place to live, for sure. As my daughter said, you know, Dad, I think that's a toy store. And I said, well, you're, you're right. I can't believe I'm revealing these secrets. Yeah. So the Greece thing was not a Fulbright. The, the Greece was, uh, I went when I was just a whippersnapper. Yeah. A whippersnapper? Did I just use the phrase whippersnapper? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm glad we didn't get through the reading without saying whippersnapper at least once. I've been hanging with my parents. And they're real people from Wisconsin. Don't you know? Yeah. Now you're going to be afraid to ask me any more questions. Anything else? Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. So there are a couple of things. Um, Christopher has books in the back for sale um, that he will happily sign for you if you are interested. So see the book. Lauren, can you wave your hand back there? Um, Lauren Allen, believe it or not, um, is back there uh, with the book so you can see over there. Also, he has cards for the study abroad program in Greece that they do too for, do you want to talk about that a little bit? And then um, thank you all for coming and keep an eye out for the emails that tell you when our next awesome potent residence reading is. Thank you. I promise two, two more seconds. Uh, so the coolest thing you can possibly do, as it turns out, as I certainly convinced you tonight, is to go to Greece for a month and write. Um, this is how we met, in fact. I run a, a writing workshop in Greece. That's actually the name of our business and our website. Uh, there are workshops in poetry, fiction, memoir, AKA nonfiction, and then I do an all-purpose, um, well, it's what my colleagues call my food pornography course. Um, it's, it's cooking and learning about traditional Greek food, and then we do travel writing and food writing. They're all really jealous of us. They go off and think hard about poems and criticize one another. We make bread in a wood oven. Uh, it's, a pretty great, it's a pretty great thing. The poetry uh, workshop is taught by Carolyn Forche. Her biography goes like this. Carolyn Forche is Carolyn Forche. If you haven't heard from her, if you haven't heard of her, look her up. Uh, Jane Ann Phillips is our fiction workshop this year. Uh, every book she writes, uh, the New York Times, you know, cries. They love it so much. Um, a, a very cool, uh, very tiny Greek woman named Natalie Bakopoulos is doing our nonfiction workshop. She's written a, a really interesting historical novel about Greece. And, you know, I make the bread. Anyway, there are cards back there with octopus on them. They make good bookmarks. Just take one. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>